Are there any problems with the modern theories of infinity? Does calculus really solve Zeno's paradoxes? If an infinite series does not have an end, can it still be completed? And is it reasonable to have any doubt about the foundations of modern mathematics? These are the questions I'm trying to answer on the 59th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Patterson in Pursuit, where this week I'm talking about some of my very favorite topics again, infinity and logic. I think this is the sixth interview that I've done on this topic with professors from at least four different countries. And if you're just tuning in for the first time, you should know that I've been trying to sort out in my mind the modern theory of infinities that was established around the turn of the 20th century. I've got some problems with the modern theories of infinities, and I'm trying to make sense of them so I don't sound so presumptuous saying, oh, hey, by the way, I think the foundations of modern mathematics are based on kind of elementary logical error. But it turns out I'm not alone. Not only is there room for skepticism in this area, I think the arguments against the standard treatment of infinities in mathematics are overwhelming. But you'll have to make up your own mind. My guest this week is Dr. Michael Humer, who has written a book very recently called Approaching Infinity, where he tries to lay out a new theory of infinities because he too finds there to be some conceptual shortcomings in the standard treatment of infinities. Dr. Humer is the professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado at Boulder. He's also the author of three other books, including the very popular The Problem of Political Authority. Now, as you'll hear, this is really fascinating. Dr. Humer and I actually have radically different conceptions of mathematics. Totally opposite ends of the spectrum, I think, in how we're thinking about what mathematics is and what numbers, for example, are. And yet, even on two opposite ends of the spectrum... We still agree, hey, more work needs to be done in this area. A bit more critical of an eye needs to be focused on infinities. It's a really sticky and difficult topic, and a paradoxes abound. So in his book, he lays out 17 different paradoxes and tries to resolve them with his proposed theory. If you want to pick up a copy of the book, head over to the show notes page. This episode is steve-patterson.com slash 59. But we didn't just talk about infinities and mathematics in this episode. Near the end, for about 10 or 20 minutes, I asked him questions about being a professional philosopher in academia because he wrote an excellent article, which you can also read at the show notes page, about the realities of publishing in the academic system, about many of the restrictions that young intellectuals are going to face if they try to make a career in the world of ideas within the established system. This is obviously a topic very close to my own heart and my own career. And it's very relevant for the sponsor of this episode, which is the company Praxis. I have decided to build my career in the world of ideas outside of academia because I don't think the present American academic system is the place for future intellectuals. I think the internet renders a lot of the services provided by the formal academic system obsolete. I don't think it's necessary to go into college, to get certified to be a productive citizen, a productive employee, or a productive intellectual. And the folks over at Praxis agree with me. In fact, they are in the business of helping young, enthusiastic, competent individuals start their careers without the formal academic credential. The Praxis program is three months of a professional boot camp that is followed by six months of a paid apprenticeship. You don't have to sit around, spend $100,000, and wait for four years to get into the real world. I think this is a far superior system. And if you're interested in learning more, go to steve-patterson.com slash praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S, and you can learn more. So let's dive into the interview with Dr. Michael Humer, who is a philosopher and author working out of the University of Colorado at Boulder. Dr. Mike Humer, thanks so much for coming on Patterson in Pursuit. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I have had several 
episodes on the show, and I've written a few articles on the theory of infinity. And whenever I do, I always get people that send me messages, that send me emails saying, you got to have Mike Humor on the show because he just wrote a book directly on this topic. It's called Approaching Infinity. And it's one of my favorite subjects. Um, And so I want to kind of start the conversation off asking you about why you wrote the book and why you think we should be even discussing infinities in the 21st century. Hasn't, haven't all of the yeah. conceptual loose ends been tied up when we're talking about theories of infinity? Right, yeah. Well, I wrote the book because I was puzzled by infinity. It's a very puzzling subject. Uh, there's a num- there are a number of paradoxes. I discussed 17 paradoxes in the book. Uh, there are a number of paradoxes that I was thinking about for many years and that don't have any generally accepted solutions. Uh, in many cases, the common response is to just um, bite the bullet, as they say in philosophy, where uh, you have some seemingly absurd consequence, and a common response will be to just accept that, just mm-hmm. accept the seemingly absurd consequence. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to, I wanted a theory that would solve the paradoxes. Uh, I wanted to just sort of figure this stuff out for myself, and and uh, and I thought if I wrote it down, it would be interesting to other people as well. Uh, at some point, I eventually thought that I had a good theory that distinguishes possible from impossible infinities. Okay. And so uh, I, had a, I had a basis for writing a book. Okay. So generally, when you talk to philosophers or even mathematicians about the subject, and let's say we're talking about Zeno's paradoxes, probably the most famous paradoxes of infinity, there's a standard response. People say, oh, calculus solves it. That's the that's the phrase. Oh, how can yes. a, a, an infinite series of points be crossed? Well, calculus solves it. Do you not find that a compelling resolution? <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I do not. Um, I I think that's confused. Um, so it depends upon what you think Zeno's problem was. Okay. So Zeno is giving an argument that motion is impossible, and uh, you know it might be open to debate what his argument was because we don't have his actual writings. Uh, we mostly have Aristotle's discussion of Zeno mm-hmm. as the basis. Okay, but so if you think that the problem was, um, so here's here's a possible argument that Zeno could have made. Um, there's an infinite series of motions which are all you know non-zero distance, and the sum of an infinite series of distances must be infinite, mm-hmm. and therefore it's going to take an infinite amount of time mm-hmm. to complete it. So you know, you'll never get to the end. Okay, if that was his argument, then indeed the theory of infinite sum solves it. Mm-hmm. Um, although uh, that would be a pretty silly argument because it's sort of stipulated at the beginning of the scenario that we're talking about a finite distance. Mm-hmm. But that's probably not the argument. And uh, if you thought that that was the argument, you probably actually never read Aristotle's discussion of Zeno's paradox. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the argument appears to be that it's impossible to complete an infinite series right? just by virtue of the meaning of infinite series. Right. right? It's inherently impossible to complete a series just because it's infinite. Uh, and you have to complete the infinite series in order to reach your destination. Right. Okay, that's not solved by calculus or the theory of infinite series. In fact, quite the opposite, right? The modern theory of calculus... Um, so far from showing that you can complete infinite series, it's basically founded on the assumption that you can't. <laughs> okay. So, right. the, so, like, so let's dive right into that because that if yeah. I were to say that, people would say, Steve, you're a crank. But I completely agree with everything you've just said. So let's. <laughs> what do you mean to say yeah. that the standard approach in calculus implies that an inf- infinite series actually cannot be uh, completed? Yeah. Well, so the way that... The way that these things are defined, so the way the sum of the infinite series is defined, the way that the derivative and the integral are defined in calculus is all in terms of these delta epsilon definitions. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, The whole point of these delta epsilon definitions is to avoid suggesting that you can get to the end of infinity, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the definition of the sum of an infinite series is not the result that you get to after you add up all the infinitely many terms, right? The sum is defined as the number that you get closer and closer to as you add up more and more terms. Exactly. 
it's it's the law it's the limit of the finite sums right and the whole point of doing that of defining it that way is to avoid assuming that you can complete the infinite sum right right it's so to, so that you can only talk about finite sums and then you can define it so um i wrote a piece on this a little while ago and i use the example if somebody's looking at a graph and they're talking about the function, you know, um, the f of x equals 1 over x. So the yeah. larger that x is um, on the, the left hand of the function, the smaller x is, you might say, on the right end of the function. And you could think about it as, as it doesn't matter how large x is. It is, by definition, not going to be meeting the asymptote. It is, by definition, it's 1 over that number, which means... It's by definition not, it, it can't reach zero. And it doesn't matter how big, it could be uh, the largest number you can possibly conceive of, and it is by definition not meeting that um, y axis. Right. There, there is no largest number that you can conceive of because uh, cause for any number, you can always say that number plus one. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah. Uh, we'll have to come back to that. But <laughs> the, limit of, the limit of 1 over x as x increases is zero. That doesn't mean that 1 over x is ever equal to 0. Exactly. It just means that it gets closer and closer to 0. It gets as close as you like as you go further to the right. Exactly. Okay. Now, that is an argument that I would use and have used to say, just like Zeno, therefore, it must be the case that motion is impossible if it's the case that reality or space is infinitely divisible. I actually buy his arguments. I just think he's wrong about <laughs> the infinite divisibility of space. But what, what is your, how is your, how do you deal with that? Yeah. Uh, space is infinitely divisible. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> we're we're going to have to live with it. Um, but it, so, yeah, most people like the following argument for the infinite divisibility of space, okay? Uh, if you think that space is only finitely divisible, mm -hmm. um, then between any two points, so the distance between any two points should be a multiple of the minimum distance, an integer multiple. Right. So there's a minimum distance. Okay. okay. Um, and uh, it seems like there could be a square, for example. So suppose there's a square. Uh, the distance between um, uh, one corner and the adjacent corner could be an integer multiple of the minimum distance. But then the distance between opposite corners cannot also be. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think that has to do with our theories of points. And maybe we can get into that a little bit later. I think there's actually a, a really wonky way that people have been conceiving of points um, for quite some time. And I know you cover this a little bit in your book. Um, but maybe so you would say then that. Uh, OK, so let me let me put it this way and see if you agree with this re rephrasing that some people get tripped up maybe by the language of mathematics when they talk about something like a sum of an infinite series. Or if you say the sum yeah. of the infinite series is one, most people yeah. think that that is a regular type of sum, that that means you add up every single individual element and then you get that number. But really when you're talking about summing infinite series, it means it's the limit. It means by definition it doesn't actually reach that number. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so, so for you, how then, how then do you rescue the concept of motion, if that is correct? Do you think that calculus in this respect is wrong, or do you have another resolution to that? Oh, I see. Um, so, so this might have been Zeno's argument. In order to move from one point to another, you have to complete an infinite series. Mm -hmm. It's impossible in general to complete an infinite series, so it's impossible to move from one point to another. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you're saying the first premise is false, and I guess I'm saying the second premise is false. Um, so objects do complete infinite series every time they move. Um, now, why would we think that you can't complete an infinite series? Mm -hmm. So uh, I can give an argument for this, which I think is fallacious, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you can tell me if you think this is the argument, right? Uh, so an infinite series is a series with no end. Mm -hmm. To complete a series, you have to come to the end of it. Mm -hmm. You can't come to the end of a series that has no end, so you can't complete an infinite series. Yeah, I buy that argument. But what, is, what right. do you think is wrong with it? Um, yeah, I think it's, a, it's an equivocation. Um, 
So you can't complete an infinite series if that means coming to the last member of the series, mm -hmm. uh, where this is an infinite series with no last member. You can't get to the last member if there's no last member. That's true. Mm -hmm. But you could arrive at a point in time at which all of the members have been completed previous to that time. And that's the sense in which you can complete the Zeno series. So um, with normal series, with a finite series, it's a condition on completing it that you complete the last stage. Mm -hmm. With an infinite series, it's not required that you complete the last stage in order to complete the series. So you don't complete the last stage, but you do complete the series? Yeah. Uh, you don't have to complete the last stage because there isn't a last stage, right? <laughs> So, you know, this is my analogy. Uh, suppose that I go away on vacation and I ask you to feed all of my pets, right? Mm -hmm. and, okay, and I come back and I say, all right, so did you feed the lizard? You go, no. I say, ah, oh, I told you to feed all my pets. And you say, but there was no lizard. Okay. Uh, if I don't have a pet lizard, then you don't have to feed the pet lizard in order to feed all of the pets. Uh, mm -hmm. Similarly, if a series doesn't have a last stage, you don't have to arrive at the last stage in order to complete all the stages. Uh, and that is the case with the Zeno series. So there, for, for every stage of the series, there's a time at which it gets completed. Uh, there's a, and there's a time at which, there's a time that's after all of the times that, this, that the steps get completed. Right, so there's a time at which all of them have been completed. But there's no time at which the last stage gets completed because there's no last stage. Okay, now that one's hard for me to conceptually wrap my head around. Can we? So let's let's use the analogy. This is the analogy I use in um, in one of the, the pieces that I wrote on this, and I think it's a little bit easier to to think about. And it's imagine we're trying to c complete a whole pie, and the way that we are going to complete the pie is first we start with half a pie, and then we take yep. a quarter of a pie, and then we take an eighth of a pie, and a sixteenth, and a thirty second, and so on. Yeah. W it, with that method of completing the pie, are you claiming that it is possible to actually have a whole pie in a finite amount of time? Well, it, de it, it depends on exactly how this is happening. Um, <laughs> but it, so uh, if I may, just sort of there's a variation on Zeno series. So actually in Aristotle's discussion of this, this variation sort of comes out um, or is sort of obliquely alluded to. Uh, suppose that at the end of each stage of the series, there's a pause, right? So like you move half the distance, stop, and then you move the next quarter of the distance and mm -hmm. then stop and so okay. on. If that's the way it goes, then you can't complete the series. Okay. Right. Um, now, uh, uh, the pauses, so if the pauses are of some uh, non-zero time and if, uh, if, if they're always at least some length of time, then the total is going to be infinite. Okay, but uh, you might say, what if the pauses get shorter and shorter? Uh, nevertheless, this is still uncompletable uh, because mm -hmm. if you have to stop each time, then you have to decelerate. Your speed has to go down to zero, and then you have to accelerate back up to uh, you know, whatever your speed is during the next step of the journey, and then you have to decelerate down again. And what that means is, uh, each, so each time you start and stop, you have to expend energy and uh, force has to be exerted on you. And the force is going to increase without bound, right? The force required to accelerate okay. you back. Okay, and that means that at some point your body is going to be destroyed, right? Because of the unlimited <laughs> forces. Also, uh, an infinite amount of energy would be required to complete it. Okay. okay, now the story about baking the pie, if you're actually doing these as discrete steps, where it, you do something analogous to stopping every time you get done with part of the pie, then you can never complete it, right? Because it's going to require an infinite amount of energy or something like that. Okay, but doesn't that imply that there's some, let's say, placement of the pie which takes no time or takes no energy? Or there's, or to, to bring it back to the, the running circumstance, doesn't that imply that there's some distance which takes exactly zero time to cross? Um. Well, in a, in a sense, there is, namely, a distance of zero. <laughs> uh, there's no non-zero distance that takes zero time to cross. I'm not sure if I understood what you were saying there. Uh, okay. 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 So in the circumstance with the pie, you're saying that if, if 
I'm not talking about stopping it at, you know, I put the one piece of the pie down and then I stop. I'm talking it's, it is one continuous process of putting the pie uh, in place. To me, yeah. it seems like what we what we've done is when we say, you know, we have like a formula for how we're putting the pieces of pie down. It seems like by the construction of that formula, we're saying every single piece of pie you put down, there by definition must be a little bit of pie left over. It has to be half, exactly half of the previous amount that you put down. So it seems like if you're saying by definition, there has to be half the pie, you know, left over. You can never, you can never complete it. That um, seems like I don't understand. I don't understand yeah. how you could. It's the same thing yeah, with that, distance. If we're saying every step, there has to be some space left over. How could it? Right. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So that definitely shows that within the series, you're never at the destination. Right. There's if you're within the series, you haven't arrived. Um, but that doesn't show that there will never be a time after the series is over. Right. At which you had arrived. But how could the series be over if during the series it never you never complete it. It's well, the series is never over while it's going on. Right? It's only over after it's over. You know, as they say, it's not over till it's over. So with the with the distance example, if I say at every point that I'm crossing, I am by I necessarily must have some space left over. Have to by the construction of crossing the infinite amount of points. Yeah, at every point within the series, you have some space left over. At every right. point. In other words, could we rephrase it by saying there is no point at which there is no space left over? Uh, yeah, that's right. But again, there's no point within the series. Right. So you arrive at the destination. When you arrive at the destination, destination is outside the series. Right. It's the destination is the is the first point after the series. So it's true that within the series, there's always some space left. I don't understand that if it's true at every point within the series, there is some space left over, that implies there is always space to go. Uh, well, if you're still within the series, then there's always space to go, right? So what logically follows is that uh, you can't get to the end while still being within the series. How does the series end then? How does that, how does that happen if right. you're still well, in the series? I mean, the time at which you're at the destination is identical to the time at which you're no longer in the series. So, so it sounds like there's kind of this magic popping that's like you're in the series and then like somehow you're outside the series and now there isn't any leftover distance. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's magical, but I mean, uh, you know, like logically everything that you're saying just implies that you can't get to the destination while still being within the series, which of course is true because like the destination point is not part of the series. Like the okay. the number one is not part of the series one half, three quarters, seven eighths, and so on, right? Okay. So so couldn't we say if Achilles, you know, is in the series, he he's the guy in the series that then he would never actually complete the series. Doesn't that follow? So he's in the series, right? So how do you get? Yeah. How do you go from being in the series well, to being yeah, out of the series? Well, he's in the series for some time, and then at a later time, he's outside it. At what point does he get outside of it? Put it this way. like for So suppose that the person is traveling at a fixed velocity, just mm -hmm. for simplicity. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know the velocity, you can calculate the time at which each member of the series gets completed. Okay. Uh, you can also calculate a time. So you calculate all those times, and you can prove that all of those times are earlier than a certain other time. Okay. Right. So say you're, you know, for simplicity, let's say the distance is one and your speed is one. Um, then, you know, provably every element of the series gets completed before time t equals one, before one unit of time has passed. Hmm. Uh, there's a specific time for each of the members, and that time is always before t equals one. So when t equals one happens, that means all of the steps got completed. In that scenario, though, it doesn't. The, to say t equals one is one unit of time, I don't think that quite works. I think if there are, uh, that would be there is one unit of time that have, has progressed. And so, the, so my s attempted solution at, at resolving Zeno's paradox is to say, well, it must be the case then that there's a base unit of time, there's a base unit of space. That uh, so a, a great analogy would be something like if you're watching motion on a screen, ultimately you have little base pixels. It looks like the the motion is continuous but it's not actually continuous it's it is discrete and so 
you might have one time, one uh, uh, unit of time elapsing, but there's no in between by definition. What we mean by one, that would be like the indivisible time unit. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we could we could talk about the uh, the argument that space isn't isn't discrete. You know. Okay. Which which again has to do with um, irrational numbers. Yes, I'd love but, to. Let's go right into that. Right. So. Um, the ratio of the diagonal of a square to the side is irrational, which means that they can't both be an integer multiple of some common base. Okay, so when we right. talk about irrational numbers, I think we have to go right into the philosophy of, of mathematics, because this is, when we talk about irrational numbers, real numbers, um, it presupposes a certain kind of conceptual framework that I think might have errors in it. There, there are other theories of mathematics which don't include real numbers, which don't include irrational numbers, where everything is discrete, nothing is infinite. And I think we have to grapple with those when we're talking about things like Zeno's paradoxes. So when, you're, when you say um, like the, the, the diagonal of the square is irrational, what do you mean by that word? Um, standard mathematical definition. So it's, uh, it can't be written as the ratio of two integers. Mm. So... Let's talk then about what numbers are. Let's talk about the metaphysics of uh, mathematics. Because yeah. there is one theory of math, a very, very popular theory, which says there are such things as infinitesimal e expressions. Right. And so something like an irrational number, you know, 0.333 uh, with a bar over it or 0.3333 and so on, that there are numbers that extend beyond where we're writing them down. Um, and I, I don't think this is a correct theory of metaphysics of math. So, so I think that, for example, numbers are concepts, they're ideas we come up with, and they don't somehow, a num just because you've written down a series of threes with a bar over them, doesn't somehow mean that you've referenced an actually infinite thing. So in your theory of numbers, what, how are you conceiving of numbers, what they are? Well, so, yeah, so you're thinking about uh, there's a number that would have an infinite decimal expansion. And then you're thinking, yeah, but that, you know, that's not real. Um, um, so my view though is that that number is not infinite uh, it might be true that the way the only way to write it down I mean, actually I mean that wasn't a good example because you can just write one over three right exactly um, but anyway you know take a take an irrational number like pi mm -hmm. uh, the only way to write it down using conventional decimal notation is to use an infinitely long um, expression, which you can't write. Okay, but that doesn't mean that the number itself is infinite. The number itself is a specific determinate quantity. Uh, it might just happen that we don't have notation that expresses it in a finite space, but that's just our expressive limitation, right? Um, so there are all of these numbers, they're all specific finite amounts. So you uh, think pi is finite? It's a finite number, right? I and mean, it's not infinity. Uh, and it's a very specific quantity. It's just that there are infinitely many of these specific finite numbers. Uh, and, you know, it's like the the appearance that there's something infinite about is it's only our notation that would be infinite if you try to write down the decimal expansion. Okay. So, so do you think it's the case that we can have a clear conception of the totality of the quantity that is trying to be expressed when we say pi, when we write down that symbol? Do you think that you can conceive of all of it? Um, I mean, there's some sense in which I conceive of all of it, and there's another sense in which I can't, right? So uh, I can conceive of pi completely because I know the definition of it, right? Like the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle. So that's a complete description of it. But that, that's a verbal linguistic description. That's not, a, that's yeah. not like a numerical understanding of what the actual quantity is. Yeah, I mean, if you mean like the decimal expansion, uh, in some sense, I can't can't comprehend that, right? And now, if that's true, though, then what? Why would we say such a thing exists? Doesn't that imply necessarily that that numbers are these things that exist separate of our conceiving of them? That there there's something yeah. out there in the world that we're trying to reference, but we can't quite fully. Yeah, there is something out there in the world. Uh, so there are, there are circles, right? And they have uh, circumferences and diameters, right? And uh, there's a ratio.
every circle that I've ever seen is a finite circle, and it's a constructed based on a certain amount of points. So an uh, analogy I love to give is just from my own career when I was doing animation work. And uh, there's, this, there's this computer program, After Effects, where you can make the most perfect circle you've ever seen in your life. But if you actually yeah. examine what the circle is, it's made up of a bunch of points. It's made up of a bunch right. of pixels, which means that there's a finite pi. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's like a numerator over a denominator in terms of how many units make up the circumference, how many units make up the diameter, and there's no infinities invoked there. Uh, yeah. It's all, also the, the circle displayed on a computer screen won't be a perfect circle, uh, nor will any other circle that anybody draws. Um, so what is the perfect, because all the, all the circles I encounter are, are, they don't have that. Well, yeah. They don't have, they're not perfect. Yeah. Well, there are, uh, there are circular regions of space, uh, you know, whether you can draw them or not. Uh, but I guess, I mean, more generally, there are specific quantities that things have and, uh, almost every physical magnitude, maybe this doesn't make sense. I was going to say almost every physical magnitude is an irrational quantity. Um, say there are two physical magnitudes that are uh, not not conceptually related to each other, okay. then it's virtually guaranteed that the ratio of the two is irrational. Right? So this, I think, assumes the uh, the infinite divisibility of space or of space time of, of physics in general. If things well, are discrete, then that would that wouldn't be the case well, at all. Yeah, I mean that is. I'm saying that there. I'm. I guess, assuming that there's infinitely many quantities, this doesn't have to be spatial. So it could be like the mass of two objects or, um, you know, energy of two objects or something. But, um, I mean, I, I guess I didn't anticipate that in addition to proposing that space was discrete, you would think that the number series was also uh, so it, finite. It comes from a particular metaphysical conception of what a number is. I don't think numbers exist separate of our minds. I think they're, I think if I say the word yeah. several, I think I'm talking about a concept in my head that if I didn't think of it, it wouldn't exist. I think that's the, ca the case if I say 3x or there are three horses, I think that's a concept that we come up with. So in a sense, yeah. in, w in one sense of the term infinite, there's an infinite amount of numbers that I can yeah. think of something bigger than whatever I'm thinking of, but in another sense, there isn't an infinite amount of numbers because there's only a finite amount of concepts that anybody's conceiving of at any given time. I see. Yeah, so uh, so my view of numbers is that uh, a number is a kind of property. Now, I don't know if you have this view about properties in general. So, uh, you know, you see two horses. Uh, let's say they're brown. They mm -hmm. have the property of brownness. I assume you wouldn't say that brown is just an idea in our mind, right? I think that brown is a label of a description, a, a label on an experience that we're having. That's what I would say. So I don't. I, w I would reject the idea that brown is something in a property of the horse. I think it's a it's a statement about an oh. experience. Um, is there something that two brown objects have in common? Conceptually, yes. Um, metaphysically, I would say no. So if there were no people, nothing would be brown? Uh, well, that's correct. So there, brown, the way that I'm looking at it, brown is a statement about a perceptual phenomena. It's a color. It's like qualia in our visual field. So by definition, if there were no minds, there were no us, there would be no oh. qualia. Well, okay, so... I mean, the nature of colors is controversial, so maybe we should take, you know, some primary quality that uh, people don't have subjectivist theories about, right? Uh, okay, so there's a square. Yeah. Uh, I, I assume that's not a, a qual in our mind, right? Squareness. I, so I think shapes and objects are constructed or constructed phenomena. So for I seem to always have a water bottle next to me whenever I'm doing these interviews. Yeah. I give the water bottle example all the time. But for example, I would say what yeah. the water bottle is, it, if I say the water bottle in front of me, I'm actually just referencing bits of matter that are arranged in a particular way, and I'm calling a water bottle. So without my mind, they okay. wouldn't be boundaried in some way. I think it's the same thing with a square. So A square okay. is a kind of composite there, object. There's an arrangement of the uh, of the particles, right? what we call an arrangement, yes. I wouldn't say that's something oh. in the world. I would say that's something that our mind is, is putting together. So, uh, well, th this is sort of getting to me interviewing you now, but... Um, <laughs> that's a conversation. I guess, I'll, I mean, I'm just going to assert, uh, okay. things have properties independent of us. Okay. Uh, and uh, 
numbers are a kind of property. So uh, like red is a property that, um, you know, tomatoes have in common with uh, red roses. You know, it's a, it's a thing that multiple uh, physical objects have in common. Similarly, two is a property. It's a thing that multiple um, pairs of things have in common. So whenever there's a pair of things, they jointly instantiate this property of two-ness. Uh, there are multiple different examples of two-ness being instantiated. So two-ness is what is in common between these different examples, right? And you can imagine the sort of examples I have in mind, right? You know, my hands and, uh, you know, the Empire State Building and the Sears Tower, you know, those are examples of two Right. And, so, and without uh, your mind, they would still have the same property? Yeah. Right. right. So that is in the sense in which any property could exist independent of the mind, uh, numbers exist independent of the mind. Right. Right. So that's about cardinal numbers. Um, the real numbers, I think, are also properties, although they're different properties. So there's there are physical magnitudes in addition to cardinal numbers. So there's, there's, there could be a certain number of objects, and then a different phenomenon is an object has a physical property that comes in degrees. And uh, the real number sort of measures the specific degree of one of these physical magnitudes, uh, like the size of an object. OK. Right, and so um, like in my view, these um, the, the numbers, like what we're referring to is there's some underlying reality uh, which could be in the physical world. Of course, numbers can also apply to mental things. So it can also be in the mental world, right? But it's not necessarily in the mind. Uh, like there could be two ideas, there can also be two rocks. Uh, and um, in my view, those are, there are as objective as anything, right? If you think anything is outside the mind, you know, you should include numbers. Oh, okay. That's good. Uh, uh, we'll put an asterisk by that one, but I want you to keep talking about your views because that, that I think is a very Im important claim that I think there's, there can be some reasonable disagreement about. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, my views are not, uh, not entirely uncontroversial, you might say. <laughs> uh, um, uh, so, uh, and I, I guess I will bring this around to infinity. So what is infinity? Uh, there's sort of a long long-standing debate about whether infinity is a number, uh, or as Cantor has it, whether there's a class of infinite numbers. Mm. Uh, in my view, infinity isn't a number um, because it's not a specific determinate quantity. So the numbers are specific determinate amounts. Mm. Um, like the cardinal numbers, four, is a determinate number of objects that you could have, or the real numbers represent determinate magnitudes that a, uh, a physical quantity can have. Okay. And infinity doesn't represent a determinate magnitude because it's something like being beyond all determinate magnitudes. So does, being, yeah. does this imply that you, you have a, a problem with the concept of an infinite cardinality? Um, uh, sort of yes, sort of no. Okay. That is, I think um, there are some categories such that there are infinitely many things of that category. Uh, that's correct. But... There being infinitely many of them is not ascribing a number to them. Okay. Can you unpack that? Right. So, like, there are infinitely many points in a line. Well, if points exist at all, there are infinitely many of them. Uh, um, but in saying that, I'm not um, assigning a specific number. What I'm saying is something like uh, the points exceed every number. Uh, yes, I like this. I like this quite a lot, um, especially if we're talking about physical space. Um, okay. So, so it's kind of like a denial of whatever property you're talking about. So if you say there's an infinite, infinite number of these things, you're actually saying it is not the case that there is some number that represents the, the totality of it. Uh, sort of, right. That is, that, that is implied. I think what you're saying is sort of, it exceeds every number mm. that is. So, uh, when I say space is infinitely large, what I'm saying is really there are infinite, there are arbitrarily large regions. That is, if you pick any definite size, there's a region larger than it. Okay. That's what it means that space is infinite. So, so let me ask you right on that topic then. Would you say that it is possible to talk about all of one of these infinite sizes? To say that you can have a, a, some totality that is an infinite size? 
Yeah, I, I think the answer is no. That is, um, is, I think my view suggests that you should deny that the term space refers to an object. Mm -hmm. Right. That is, so a traditional view of what it means to say space is infinite is there's an object called space, mm -hmm. and it has a volume. Mm -hmm. And its volume is equal to infinity, mm -hmm. which, and, that, and that would be a particular number. Mm -hmm. And uh, my view is no. What it means to say space, it's not that there's this object called space. It's that there are regions and there are larger and larger regions without limit. And when you say space is infinite, you're just referring to that fact. What do you mean by regions? Uh, like a finite volume of space. So, so when you say of space, uh, to say it's not an object, I mean, I agree it's not, it's not one thing. I think it's kind of a way of talking, but it sounds like even in that, you're, it still sounds like it's something, right, when you're talking about space. Uh, well, uh, there's space, the mass noun, like this takes up a lot of space. Mm. And then there's space conceived as a single object, right? So I don't think there's a single object that's all of space. Okay. Right, there are just spatial regions, and there are larger and larger ones. Okay. And there's no limit to them. So in that sense, they're infinite. Okay. Uh, right, so like similarly, uh, what it means to say that a set is infinite, um, side point, I have, uh, I have arguments questioning whether sets even exist, but let's for now suppose okay. that sets exist. Okay. What it means to say that a set is infinite is there are arbitrarily large subsets of it. That is, if you take any natural number, the set has a subset that contains more than that many elements. Uh, this is distinguished from the Cantorian conception, where what it means to say the set is infinite is it's to assign a specific number as the number of elements in that set, right? And it's an infinite number. Is that correct, though? Because I, I think that they might push back, people who support the Cantorian notion might push back and say, no, all that it means is to say that there is one-to-one -one correspondence between each element of the subset and the, the set, which is not to say that there is a number that is infinity that represents the total size. They just say, yeah. well, all, all that it means is that there's this correspondence. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, one attempted way of defining infinite set is it's a set that can be mapped one-to-one -one onto a proper subset of itself. Okay. Right. However, uh, it was the view of Cantor and Frege and Russell that uh, there are infinite numbers. And they're so, these infinite numbers are supposed to be numbers in exactly the same sense that four is a number. Right, but hasn't this, isn't this, from my understanding, I might be wrong here, but hasn't that idea been, not debunked, but that I don't think that's the orthodox position anymore, to say that there is such a thing as that infinite number like any other number. I don't. It, it, are you saying that that's the the mainstream view? I think it is. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, it's a, they're they're supposed to be, so uh, like Aleph null is supposed to be a cardinal number, in the same sense that four is a cardinal number. It happens to be an infinite number instead of a finite number, but that's okay. It's still a number. I don't. So I've had a few conversations with people on the show about this, and I and that. Yeah. I get a lot of pushback when I say that because what they'll say is well no we we're talking about cardinalities we're talking about numbers in a different sense when they're infinite just like when they're talking about infinite sums the summation of an infinite series I think well yeah we use the term sum but it actually means something different and that, that seems to be okay. the case what they say is well we're not actually claiming there is this number it's kind of a way of there's this kind of a way of talking but it means something yeah. different well uh I, I can only say that might be some people's view okay but uh i mean the People who were working in the foundations of mathematics, including Cantor, thought. So I'll, I'll just tell you why they thought it was a number in the same sense, right? Because mm -hmm. they had a theory of what a number was, mm -hmm. and it, it was that a number was a certain kind of set, and uh, you could find a set that's so that they thought that the number two was a certain kind of set, right? Mm -hmm. You know, something like it's the set of all two-membered sets, <laughs> something like that. Okay, um, and. In the way that you define the ordinary natural numbers, you can define another object within set theory that looks just like that, right? It's just like the finite numbers, except that it's infinite, right? So it's very natural to say that it's a number two. Um, so, uh, like, 
the number two is supposed to be um, the set of all sets that can be mapped one to one onto the set that contains zero and one, something mm. like that. Mm. Uh, and aleph null is the set of all sets that can be mapped one to one onto the set of all natural numbers. So like you see that there's this pretty perfect parallel. If you bought the original theory about the natural numbers, mm. then you should buy that the infinite numbers are also numbers. Okay, I, I'm. This is interesting because I'm put in a, in a position I haven't. I've been in before. Usually, I'm the one arguing with mathematicians about this, and they say, <laughs> "So I have to. Def I I have to put another asterisk and say, I don't agree with the orthodox theory. I think it needs revision, but I'm not sure that they would agree with that position. So I don't. I can't defend them because I disagree yeah. with them. But I would say they might push back a little bit on that. At least some of them that I've spoken with. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's okay with me if, uh, if the mathematicians reject Cantor's theory. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be happy with that. Um, I guess I've, I've talked to philosophers a lot more than mathematicians, so mm. I can't really comment on what most contemporary mathematicians think. Okay. Yeah, but so uh, my problem with this is I just don't buy the original theory about what a number is. I don't think a number is a set. Okay. So I think it's a certain kind of property that a collection can have. Uh, now, it doesn't follow from that that infinity can't be a number, but it also doesn't follow that it is a number. Okay, so let me ask you, how important do you think metaphysics is to talking about uh, infinities and mathematics in general? Because it seems like we have different competing theories about what numbers are that lead to radically different conclusions about you know theories of infinity. Yeah. Well, I guess I would say uh, metaphysics is important if you want to understand what the thing actually is, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's possible to do a certain amount of work in mathematics without uh, thinking about the metaphysics of the underlying objects that are being referred to. Um, but if you, I mean, as a philosopher, I want to understand what the things are that we're talking about. So. Yeah. It seems like that if, if the former situation might result in in potential errors, because, for example, yeah. in theology, this happens all the time, where theologians will be talking about God, the properties of God, what is implied by God, and it might be the case that they're using some con some some term that is supposed to have a metaphysical referent, where they've actually made an error, and then that maybe their metaphysical referent doesn't make sense, and so all of their theories are kind of built on a metaphysical error, even though you might right. not see it in the theories. And from somebody outside mathematics who is very skeptical of some of the claims in the, the foundations of math and the, and the work of Cantor, I think yeah. it actually is a pretty big deal because if numbers don't exist separate of our conceiving of them, then it is definitely the case that we have to eject infinity from all of our thinking about mathematics because we can't yeah. conceive of all of an infinity. No, that's right. So, yeah, so if numbers are uh, mental, then there can only be finitely many of them because mm. there are only finitely many mental states. Right. Uh, which uh, I, I gather that most people think is crazy. <laughs> like, uh, and uh, especially mathematicians would think that it's crazy that there are only finitely many numbers, right? So like, hmm. on your view, there's a largest natural number. At any given right? time, yes. But, but think, about it, yeah. th think about it this way, though. That's, it sounds crazy until you think, okay, well, ma I think mathematics in general is a language that expresses concepts that can say true things about the world. So I'd also say the same thing about sentences. At any given time, there is a largest sentence that is being conceived. That doesn't mean that yeah. you can't add, num add words to it, it's the same right. thing with yep. numbers. You could think of a really big number, sure. You could think of Graham's number raised to a power of itself. Wow, that's a, yeah. that's a really big number. But that doesn't mean you can't conceive of a bigger one. So it's at any given time, yeah. it's finite, which I don't, which I, does, may, seems to make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I only disagree with the starting point there. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I guess like we would have to have sort of a... Um, more fundamental background debate about the nature of universals, right? Yeah, and, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, but I would love to have that conversation, but um, let, I'll try to bring it back here um, to uh, mathematics and infinity. So you and I, I think, are in agreement that the orthodox treatment of infinities is not philosophically satisfactory, that calculus maybe doesn't solve of Zeno's paradoxes. My position is the extreme end of the spectrum where I'm saying there is no such thing as an actual infinite. 
because of my metaphysical beliefs. You're right. saying there actually are circumstances of actual infinites. So right. can you give yeah. some examples of what of all? And in fact, in, in reading your yeah. book, it seems like you think there are lots of actual infinites. So can you talk a bit about yeah. where right. those are? Yeah, there are lots of them. So uh, I draw a distinction between different kinds of uh, quantities, you might say. So there are cardinal numbers and there are magnitudes. So a cardinal number is an answer to a how many question. Uh, so like four and three and 75. Um, and then there are physical magnitudes like your height or your mass or the temperature of this room and so on. Among the, among the magnitudes, there are intensive and extensive magnitudes. Extensive magnitudes are roughly ones that are additive across the parts of a thing. Um, so length is extensive. If you have uh, if you have an object with a certain length, the left half, um, the length of the left half plus the length of the right half will have to be the length of the whole thing. Uh, intensive magnitudes are not additive in this way. So the temperature of this room, uh, it's not the case that the temperature of the room is the sum of the left half and the right half temperatures. Hmm. Okay, so in my in my view, you can have an infinite cardinal number and you can have an infinite extensive magnitude, but you cannot have an infinite intensive magnitude. Hmm. Okay, so uh, examples, uh, well, there are infinitely many natural numbers, and there are infinitely many regions of space. Those are examples of infinite cardinality. Uh, space is infinitely extended, so that's an example of infinite extensive magnitude. Um, the, the future is infinite, that is time is going to extend forever. Also, I think the past is infinite, but that's more controversial. Uh, that, again, is an example of infinite extensive magnitude. Uh, okay. But there are no infinite intensive magnitudes. So, for example, there can't be a thing with infinite temperature. Or uh, there can't be infinite uh, energy density in a particular region of space. So you're making a claim that um, a lot of physicists also might object to, because at least the way they talk, maybe they don't mean this a literal, there is this idea in physics that says in some circumstances, maybe the center of a black hole, you do have some, something like infinite density or maybe infinite temperature. You, th you say that would be logically impossible. Yeah. Yeah, I, I should say, though, that uh, so it is true that it's a prediction of general relativity that you can have infinite energy density in, uh, in a black hole. Uh, that's what a black hole is. Uh, but it's also true that that's widely regarded as a, an outstanding problem. Mm, mm. That is, people are trying to figure out how to get rid of the infinities um, uh, in a black hole or uh, at, the, at the location of the Big Bang. Hmm. And is this for purely philosophic theoretical reasons? Well, I I, I think it's for sort of physics problem solving reason, reasons. You know, a bunch of quantities go infinite, and you can't figure out um, uh, can't figure out what's going on. Um, right. Okay, but uh, but the reason for this um, distinction is uh, I can give an explanation of infinite cardinality where. The explanation is not going to use infinity as a quantity. And I can give an explanation for infinite extensive magnitudes, where, like, when I explain what it means, I can explain it in terms of finite quantities. But I cannot do that for infinite intensive magnitudes. Hmm. Um, so uh, for a set to be infinite means it has arbitrarily large subsets. That is, um, for any natural number, you can find a subset with that many elements. Mm -hmm. And notice that in saying that, I only refer to natural numbers. Uh, for space to be infinitely extended, it has to be that uh, for any finite volume you pick, there's a region of space with at least that volume. And there, I only refer to finite volumes. But if I want to ascribe an infinite intensive magnitude to something, I can't give that kind of explanation. Right. So if something has an infinite temperature, um, I can't say that that means that it has arbitrarily large finite temperatures, right? Because its temperature isn't the mm -hmm. result of a bunch of parts having temperatures. I just have to say that the one temperature of that object is infinity, right? I have to ascribe some one magnitude that's larger than all finite magnitudes. So it sounds like this is directly related to the theory of sets in general, the way that you're conceiving of, of sets. Um, yeah. 
So do you want to talk about, you, you uh, left a cliffhanger there. You said, well, this is assuming that sets exist. Do you want to talk about that for a few minutes? Yeah, I'm a little skeptical about sets. And uh, my reason is not the reason that philosophers usually have, which is philosophers usually say, oh, it would be better to make the world simpler or something like that. Uh, my reason is that I just don't think anyone has given a good explanation of what these things are supposed to be. Hmm. Right. So uh, if you look in books that are explaining, you know, a little bit about set theory, uh, sometimes they say a set is just a collection. Mm. OK, but uh, it seems like the mathematical concept of a set is not the concept of a collection that we're familiar with. So in the normal uh, in the normal sense of collection, if I don't have anything, I don't have a collection. Mm. Like, if I don't have a car, I don't have a collection of cars. Mm. But uh, in the mathematical sense, there's a thing called the empty set, right. which you have when you don't have anything to collect. Uh, also, in the mathematical sense, there's a thing called a singleton set, which is distinct from its member. Uh, but in the ordinary sense of a collection, if I have one car, I don't know if that counts as a collection of cars, but it's certainly not that I have two objects, the car and the collection of the car. Now, now, isn't that kind of a way of talking, though? So it's almost in an I ironic sense. So I could say, you know, the, my set of uh, all bank accounts which contain a million dollars or more. Right. And that's kind of a, I could say that. And it seems yeah. like it's communicating a concept in kind of a funny way because I don't have anything. Yeah. But but yeah. you're saying that that would not that doesn't work. Well, uh, yeah, it depends upon what you say about that thing. Right. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so if you just say the set of uh, bank accounts with over a million dollars owned by me is empty, that's just a funny way of saying that you don't have a bank account with a right. million dollars in it. Right. Right. But there are other things that are said, you know, in set theory where you can't really paraphrase it away. It has to be treating the empty set like it was an object uh, or treating singleton sets as if they were distinct. Can right? you give so an example? Start... So, um, you know, in pure set theory, you're supposed to be able to construct this infinite hierarchy of numbers, including an infinite hierarchy of infinite numbers, mm -hmm. all starting from the empty set, right? So when you get to the point where you're counting objects and you're getting infinitely many of them and they all started from the empty set, I, I don't think there's any way of paraphrasing that away where you just say there isn't any of something, right? Uh, uh, okay, okay, well, let me try one. Uh, what if it's the case that what a set is, is a concept, <laughs> it's a conceptual yeah. boundary that we place usually around uh, individual particulars. So there's a little bowl of almonds in front of me. If I were to say, you know, so I'll take three out and I've got three on the, on the table here. If I were to say <laughs> the set of all almonds that are on the table in front of me, that is a, an additional thing that is separate from the almonds and it is a conceptual boundary that I am placing around the actual individual units. Does that work? Yeah. Um, so uh, by a concept, you mean like a, a certain kind of mental state? It's an idea. Right? Yeah. Yes. I'm not exactly sure what yeah. concepts are, but it's something like a mental state. Yeah. So, uh, so then there would only be finitely many of them, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, so, not, that's not a problem, though, for, for my particular yeah. theory. But, you know, in, uh, in set theory, it's uncontroversial that there are infinitely many sets. I see. I see. Okay. So I, I agree that, that my theory is not uh, compatible with the, with the orthodox theory, but you said earlier that yeah. there hasn't been, an, there hasn't really been yeah. defined, so you're skeptical that they exist. What about the definition I've just given you? Do you, do you, well, yeah. So I guess I would say, yeah, I believe in concepts. So like, I believe that you could have a concept of the almonds on the table. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just don't think that that's what people mean by a set, right? Because like people don't talk about sets the way that they would talk about ideas in the mind. Well, if they're careful, they can, though. I mean, I can say that the yeah. concept of the this collection, the thing that I'm treating as one object, I could say that it is uh, not spatially extended, while the the things that it's referencing, the 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 reference in the set, do have spatial extension. So I could, if I wanted to be precise, distinguish between the the mental thing and the thing that it's ref the thing that it's referencing. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you're a mind-body dualist, you can say that, right? Okay, uh, which I am. <laughs> if it, yeah, if you're a physicalist, then the uh, the idea might have an extension. Okay, uh, but fair enough. Anyway, leaving that aside, uh, yeah, that's okay with me. I mean, I'm not concerned to argue that the idea doesn't exist. Okay. Um, 
Right, but uh, but I would say like I don't think anyone else is going to accept that that's that's what sets are. Okay, so then your position is you you don't know whether they exist at all, or do you have a a different idea of what a set is? Um, I'm skeptical that they exist at all. Um, I mean, we should think there's something very strange about this. So I have all right. So you have some almonds, and mm -hmm. then according to the standard theory. Just the fact that you have almonds automatically makes another thing exist, which is not the almonds. And uh, it's not the muriological sum of the almonds either. Right? So that it's not a physical object that has the almonds as parts. It's mm -hmm. just some other abstract object. Mm -hmm. And by the way, in standard set theory, there's not only that, but you're going to get a whole bunch more objects. In fact, you're going to get an infinite number of things coming into existence just because you had three almonds. Right. Uh, Here's another view. When you have three almonds, you just have three almonds. Like, not you don't have to have an infinite collection but, of abstract objects. But isn't that what you're uh, doing when you have a metaphysics of numbers that says numbers exist out there? So in a sense, you're doing this. I think it sounds like you're yeah. doing the same thing. When there are three almonds, there is an additional thing, which is three in addition to the almonds, and which is separate from yeah. you. Well, there are, there are properties. There are properties of... I see. Things, I see. So you're saying the you're saying the number is the property. It's not this separate thing in addition to the almonds. Yeah. I mean, look. I think I think that I can explain what the number is. Okay. Like I can I can give examples of it. I could say it's what these things have in common, and then I give you know several examples of threeness. Uh, if somebody wants to explain what the set is, it's really hard to explain. Hmm. Um, Cantor gave this brief description at one point where. It was something like um, it's a many that permits itself to be regarded as one. Mm. Okay, but on the face of it, you might think um, so many things are not in fact one thing. So if introducing sets amounts to regarding many things as one thing, isn't it just an error? Unless we say that the, uh, that it's a concept. That's in, actually, I kind of like that definition because... We could say something like we're treating it as one unit. It's not obvious; it's not one unit, but we're treating it as one because it's an idea we've come up with. Yeah, you might think, isn't that just an error? Like treating many things as one thing when they're not, right? It's like, why why don't I introduce an object where if something is blue, you can treat it as red, and then if it's, <laughs> then there's a new object that's red. Yeah. Well, I mean. Okay, I, I guess if, if we're going to reject the, the idea that sets are ideas, then I, I agree that it is kind of absurd, but it's, it makes a great deal of sense to me when we're, when we're talking about... So if I were um, a shopkeeper and I were dealing with lots of units I wanted to come up with, it makes a lot of sense to me to think instead of... Like if I have 4 plus 4, it makes sense to say I'm not going to... You know, if I'm trying to add those, what is four? Well, it's you know four individual units. I'm not going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to to add those together. I'm going to say, okay, well, I'm going to chunk these four units as one thing, and then just memorize four plus four equals eight. It seems like that's a great shorthand. Um, yeah, that sounds okay to me. I mean, uh, I'm not I'm not prohibiting people from grouping things together, hmm. right? But uh, I'm I'm just uh, worried about the sort of metaphysics when you treat that as another object, mm. right? Like when you think that there really is such an object. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, if you think about the way people talk about sets, um, okay, so if you go to sleep, then something will happen to your idea. Well, maybe the idea will still be there in a dispositional form. If you, if you die, then the idea of the almonds will go away. Mm. I assume that you're the only person who saw them. So, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, nobody in mathematics would say that you can destroy a set, right? By like killing the person who's thinking about it. Well, so but we can easily say it's the same thing with with sentences. I mean, if I'm conceiving yeah. of the sentence, you know, the 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 cat jumped over the mat, then yeah. when I'm not thinking about it, it goes away. But that doesn't preclude anybody else from thinking about those same words. And when they're thinking about yeah. them, well, then it exists again. Yeah. No, that's right. Right. But I mean, like the sets are standardly treated as, um, you know, they're mathematical objects. Right. Which you can't do anything to. You can't right. interact with them. They don't cause anything. Et right. 
Well, this is a great segue. The last thing that I wanted to talk to you about, but I don't think we're going to have much time. You've said a few times that you know the, the standard treatment is what you object to, um, and you and I are in, a, in agreement on that. Um, you wrote a few years ago a excellent piece <coughs> about um, academic publishing, about li- yeah. uh, people who maybe are undergraduate students who haven't gone to college have a very romantic idea of what um, academic life is. Everybody takes the, the work of the professor seriously. All the professors are really seriously engaged in the world of ideas. But it seems like for somebody, I'll just say for somebody like me, who's outside the system with radical views, if I were to come out as some some philosopher and say, hey, you know what, I think the orthodox treatment of set theory is wrong for the last century, and they've been making fundamental errors, nobody's going to take that seriously. So I found that I have a much more effective impact in the world of ideas just being outside the system and say, okay, well, I'm not going to play that game. I'm just going to do my own thing. Um, And so far, so good. But you wrote a fantastic piece, which I'll make sure to link to uh, in the show notes page, where you essentially say, hey, look, you know, lots of people are interested in philosophy. It's a great gig if you have a certain disposition, but it's not so romantic. The the, the reality of academic publishing, if you're interested in the world of ideas, isn't so, uh, it's not as it might seem when you're an undergraduate student. So could you talk a little, could you put a little bit meat on the bones here for somebody that is interested in the world of ideas and has a a vision of what it would be like to be a professional academic? Yeah, I guess uh, I want to preface this by saying uh, it's not that there's some other thing that you can do that's going to be really great. (laughs) I mean, it's virtually impossible to influence the culture, right? Like if you want to change the culture and like correct the bad ideas that are out there in our society, it's almost impossible. In fact, you should basically assume that you won't be able to do it no matter what. (laughs) That's the spirit. Uh, But anyway, uh, and it's not because nobody does that. It's just that of the people who try to do that, the percentage who succeed is so tiny right. that it's rational for you to basically assume that you won't be one of them. Right. Okay. <laughs> anyway, and the academic world is, uh, it's a lot harder than you might think when you're an undergraduate student. Mm-hmm. Students don't realize, I guess, kind of don't realize how much, um, like how many academics there are and how much material is already published and how right. much more is getting published every year. Right. And when you think about these things, um, so there are thousands and thousands of philosophy articles and books published every year. Uh, So when I checked several years ago, um, the Philosopher's Index was getting 14,000 new records every year. Uh, So you throw your paper into a pile of 14,000 papers and books. Right. And it's almost impossible to get anyone to pay attention to it. Right. Um, uh, If you're an academic, you kind of... You have to try to get into one of the top journals. That they reject 90 to 95 percent of all submissions, mm. uh, and they reject them for reasons like um, one, the referee thinks you're wrong. Number two, the referee thinks you're right, but it's obvious that you're right, so there's no point in saying it. Just, just <laughs> yeah. so people get an idea, when you say the referee, what, what is that? Who are you talking about? Yes, you submit your paper to the journal, and they send it out to some other professor who works on that subject. And by the way, uh, they might be sending it to the person that your paper is criticizing. That has <laughs> happened. Uh, or, you know, just somebody that you listed in your bibliography. Hmm. Uh, they probably send it to two if it's a good journal, two referees. And uh, if one of the referees thinks that you're wrong, there's a pretty good chance that he's going to recommend rejection for that reason. Uh, or if he thinks that you're obviously right, he might recommend rejection because there's no point in saying this thing that's obvious. Mm. Or if he thinks it's too similar to things that somebody else have said, somebody else has said. Mm. Uh, uh, or if um, it's not sufficiently tied to the literature. Mm. Okay, so these four reasons together cover almost everything that you could write. <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost impossible. And uh, the loophole is you have to take something that is so highly specialized that it hasn't been said before, like going into some incredibly tiny part of the question. Right. right? Or take something that is so closely tied to the exact course of the recent discussion Mm. that it wouldn't have been said in the previous 2,000 years of philosophy, right? Right. Uh, And this is a large part of the explanation of why academic work is boring to most people. 
right? Because just a whole lot of the work is just really tied to a specific discussion that happened like in the last several years. Right. Right. So that people who are not in that discussion, it's not interesting to them. Well, and on top right. of that, these these papers are literally not read by almost anybody. I think I saw a study recently that said uh, the vast majority of papers are read by exactly zero people. And then, uh, uh, I don't know, 20% more than that, I don't know what the exact numbers are, are read by, you know, two or three people. So the amount of work that goes into writing on a topic, trying to find something novel to say, citing other people's work so that you get accepted, commenting on it on an issue that might be totally irrelevant, just so that you can put it on your resume, because that's part of the credentialing process, and you need that because it's publish or perish, and your work's yeah. not going to be read anyway, that that does not seem um, like a romantic <laughs> intellectual life yes. to me. Right, yeah, it's hard. Well, uh, yeah, so here's here's how you should estimate how many people are going to read your paper. Uh, there are 14,000 philosophy articles and books. What percentage of them are you going to read this year? <laughs> That's just 14,000 just this year. What percentage of them are you going to read? A fraction of a percent. Um, yeah. Well, that's probably a, you know, a good initial estimate of the percentage of people who are going to read your article. Right. <laughs> that's the percentage of the profession. There's uh, you know, a fraction of a percent of the profession might read your paper. Okay. So that is academic publishing. In terms yeah. of... Um, what, what about teaching, though, right? So maybe the publishing, you have the pressure to do all, to, to bend over backwards to publish work that nobody's going to read. It might not be that interesting, but you got to do so. But, but d isn't the reward in teaching people who are interested in philosophy? Yeah, I mean, um, well, there's a big difference between philosophy majors and non-majors. Hmm. Uh, but, it, like, at most schools, most of the students are there to get a credential, you know, more than they are there to learn about philosophy, right? right. So especially in the lower division courses, they're there to, uh, you know, they're, they're satisfied, they're jumping through the hoops so that they can get the degree at the end. Um, so in other so, words, they're not particularly yeah. engaged with philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Now, when you get to upper division classes, then you get philosophy majors who are usually more interested in it. Hmm. Uh, and so, you know, that's fun. And you might have a chance to influence people through your teaching, although mm. you probably won't know, mm. right? Um, you know, one of the things that people don't realize about the academic world that I think I myself didn't think about at all was there are things that you're supposed to do besides research and teaching. That is, you're supposed to do annoying administrative tasks. <laughs> like, for example, the philosophy department has to admit new graduate students every year, and we get between 100 and 200 applications. Somebody has to read them mm. and, and decide who can get in, right? So you get on these committees doing these administrative um, chores that are really tedious, uh, you know, which is, uh, which is supposed to be about 20% of our work. Ooh. Okay, so then the question is, as somebody who is uh, interested, passionate about philosophy, written a book that's been read by a lot of people about philosophy, I'm not yet 27, I've got a podcast that's listened to by thousands of people, I've got a website that's visited by tens of thousands of people, making an impact, I get feedback from people all the time, but I'm not in academia. Is there a case to be made for the young, interested philosopher to go into this system when there seems like there's a pretty awesome alternative, which is you research what you want to research, you write what you want to write, how you want to write, the audience is going to find you, and you can do it without any of the bureaucratic nonsense. You don't have to do any of the right. administrative stuff. Yeah, I mean, so like I can't, I don't know very much about the uh, alternative system. I would guess, though, that it's extremely hard to make it. It's uh, very difficult to make a living doing intellectual work outside of the academy. Yeah. Uh, I guess also that it's harder to get people to listen to you, even harder, right? Well, that's definitely the case, yes. Um, by the way, like, you know, I, I mean, after my sort of uh, sounded like complaints about the academic world, I should say, like, I've, uh, I don't regret it for a second. I mean, it's right. been awesome to me. Right. Uh, I got a job at a major research school, and I get to work on whatever I want, and people mm. pay me a pretty good amount of money, you know, for doing the things that I wanted to do, right. mostly. 
However, most people do not get a job in a research school, so they wind up having to teach a lot more than they wanted to. Right. Uh, and, you know, they get, they get tired. Also, uh, most people don't, like, don't get the amount of attention that I have for my work. So right. I've, I've done pretty well at getting people to listen to me, but most people do not succeed. Yes, and there's definitely juicy jobs um, to be had in academia. There's no question about it. It's just for somebody that, and I, I agree, it is hard to get people to take you seriously. I have lots of personal experience with that. However, on the other hand, again, somebody being outside the academy, my partially economic analysis is that there's too many professional philosophers. There's too many professional academics out there that it's kind yeah. of a skewed market. So naturally to make it as a, as a, and as an intellectual in general is really, really hard. And it might be the case that you have better chances in academia, but maybe not because you're right now. Part of the difficulty when I talk to these people, as I'm doing the show is people don't have a platform for their, their ideas. I mean, they'll be working in academia for 20 years and Try, and playing by the system, trying to play by the rules, and then immediately just coming on the show from some guy you know, who's got a, a microphone and access to the internet, they get immediately get 10 times more exposure than they otherwise would have. So it seems yeah. like you might actually have a better chance bypassing the system altogether if you can, if you can handle the, the criticism and people calling you a crank and, oh, you don't have credentials. <laughs> My guess yeah. is you probably actually have a better, better shot at it if you have what it takes to be somebody that's just professionally working in the world of ideas. All right, yeah. I mean, my guess is uh, most of the academics that you're thinking of didn't try to get uh, a wide audience, right? Um, that is, uh, is it the case just... that there's an academic that doesn't want a wide audience? Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, okay. that is, uh, um, or you might say, well, maybe they want it a little bit, but they don't want it enough to make much effort, right? Mm. Is there are a okay. lot of people who are content to just like do their job in their, in their school, Okay, that's and, fair. You know, yeah, um, and the, it's kind of, I mean, it's stable in a way that going out on your own is not. Like That is true. Yeah, I could sit in this job, okay, I have tenure, so I can just, you know, I can do whatever, and I don't have to worry if uh, somebody doesn't like what I'm doing. I don't have to worry about losing customers or something because I right. could just stay here for 20 years. Right. And, uh, and, I, and I have a steady income. Right. That's true. That is true. Uh, I guess. I guess maybe the the crowd that I'm thinking about are those really passionate people that aren't necessarily looking for a comfortable career, but are looking to really genuinely engage with and affect the world of ideas. Of which maybe there aren't many, but I think there are. I think there are a lot that have been very um, disenchanted by their experiences in academia. I would be one of them. Um, yeah. But I I think yeah. there really is there is an emerging opportunity online that the world has really never seen right now that you actually have a global voice just through new technology that has never existed. And it seems like it may, just like the internet is changing a lot of market dynamics in other areas. It seems like this is an area ripe for, um, some significant shift. Yeah. Uh, sounds fair. I mean, let, you know, I would just say that you could, you could still do this as an academic, right? So I think about mm. people like Brian Kaplan, mm. Um, who has a you know very popular economics blog, mm -hmm. and I I would guess that his academic job has helped him because like mm. he doesn't have to worry about putting food on the table because mm. uh, he has the academic job he has a steady income and mm. now that's he true. can just uh, you know write about whatever he wants on his blog. I think that's a great point, and I, I think there are going to be some people, yourself included, um, who really are exceptional writers and communicators. Who it doesn't really matter if they're inside the academy or outside, they're going to stand a good chance of making it. But if they're inside the academy, like you said, it's guaranteed paycheck, uh, and and it comes with the prestige as well. Um, of course, only if you get tenure. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Well, this is a. I really appreciate the conversation. This is a great note to end on. Um, yeah. If it, do you have a website that you'd like to send people to if they're interested in more of your work? Um, uh, yeah, you could just Google my name and find my website. Um, and you know, and I have that book, Approaching Infinity. So uh, everybody should buy it. Yes, I'll make sure to put a link in the show notes page. Thanks so much, Doctor Humor. This has been fantastic. All right, thank you. Okay, that was my conversation with Dr. Mike Humer. Hope you guys liked it. I felt like with that interview, 
I could have talked to him for probably a solid four more hours just trying to get down to some basic agreement about metaphysics, really about the metaphysics of numbers and mathematics and the connection between our concepts and the world and what his arguments are for thinking that numbers exist outside of our minds. There's really more fundamental stuff that I feel like had to be established before we even get into talking about the infinities, which is awesome. This is one of the reasons I, I am in love with philosophy and I got sucked into it because whenever you're talking about a subject with somebody that knows what they're talking about, immediately you start talking philosophy. You get down to really fundamental things and it becomes very apparent, oh hey, we got all this other stuff we got to sort out before we even start talking about what we thought we needed to talk about. So I hope that in the future I'll be able to have Dr. Humor back on the show. There's also a bunch of other topics. We've got these areas of mutual interest in epistemology and metaphysics and politics. So hopefully he'll be back on the show and we'll try to sort those things out as well. All right, that's all for me this week. Enjoy the rest of your day.